Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, editor in chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, transfer pricing on trial. Over the years, we've covered a number of U.S. court cases focused on transfer pricing issues. And for much of the history of U.S. transfer pricing litigation, there's been a nearly uninterrupted streak of taxpayer wins. But that situation has changed, and today we're going to check in on a case that we've covered a few months ago, hear about a recent trial in the U.S. tax court, and take an early look at a dispute that's just getting started. Here to go over all of this is Tax Notes legal reporter Ryan Finley. Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, I mentioned at the top that the government has had kind of a track record of losing transfer pricing cases, but that that seems to be turning around. Could you tell us about that? Sure. So the IRS's track record, particularly in, you know, some of the highest profile cases involving the largest dollar sums, has been relatively poor going back for decades. Just sort of looking at the last couple of years, the IRS lost the Altera case before the tax court in 2015. It lost the Medtronic case, which I think we might cover in a few minutes, before the tax court in 2016. And it lost the Amazon case before the tax court in 2017. Now, the Amazon opinion by the tax court was eventually upheld by the Ninth Circuit, but the IRS succeeded in getting Medtronic vacated and remanded in 2018. And it also succeeded in getting Altera reversed in 2019. So really starting with, you know, maybe around 2018, or there were some cases slightly before that may have augured in this shift. But in the last couple of years, it has been looking a lot more favorable for the IRS. And and the Coca-Cola opinion, which I think we'll also discuss, is probably the biggest indication of that new trend. All right. So let's start with Coca-Cola. Now, you were on in late 2020 to talk about this case, which we'll link to in the show notes. But could you start off with an overview of the issue and what the tax court decided? Sure. So in Coca-Cola, there were a number of issues. One of the issues was whether a profit allocation formula approved in a closing agreement that covered 1987 through 1995 and was subsequently accepted for a decade thereafter was binding on the IRS for the 2007 through 2009 tax years. The IRS for those tax years, after having accepted this profit allocation formula for nearly two decades, decided that the method was unreasonable and required the application of a different method, in this case, the comparable profits method or CPM. You know, there's a dispute in addition to the sort of binding nature of the closing agreement about whether the CPM under the U.S. Section 482 regulations was the best method or whether the sort of routine return on assets that it left Coca-Cola's foreign subsidiaries with was insufficient in relation to the intangibles and risks held by these affiliates. So what's happened more recently? So the biggest recent development is a motion for reconsideration that was filed by Coca-Cola in June. Since the tax court opinion came out in 2020, which basically it upheld nearly $10 billion in transfer pricing adjustments, Coca-Cola has given every indication that it planned to appeal, but it can't appeal Coca-Cola until a tax court opinion in another case, 3M, is released. And that case deals with a specific issue, the blocked income issue. The Coca-Cola opinion was released, but stayed that issue. So in the meantime, the company filed a motion for reconsideration with the tax court, and it previews a lot of the arguments that Coca-Cola would be likely to bring on an appeal. The arguments generally focus more on administrative law and alleged constitutional violations by the IRS. Basically, the argument is that, you know, the company's agreement with the IRS on a profit allocation formula And then the IRS's subsequent acceptance of that formula for over 10 years, in combination with this penalty protection provision that the closing agreement extended for Coca-Cola, if it continued applying the same method, that all that together gave Coca-Cola what it called reasonable reliance interests in the IRS's continued acceptance of that formula. The motion also criticizes the tax court's acceptance of the IRS's preferred method, the CPM. According to the motion, the supply points were risks by virtue of the marketing costs that were allocated to them, and that they also held rights and intangibles under their licenses with Coca-Cola, and that these risks and intangibles entitled these foreign affiliates or supply points to a higher return under the, the Section 482 regulations. So how much money are we talking about being at risk in this case? Well, the original deficiencies associated with the roughly $10 billion transfer pricing adjustments added up to about $3.3 billion. 
Now, that doesn't directly translate into what the deficiency would be now because the tax court accepted Coca-Cola's sort of secondary argument about whether repatriated dividends could be credited against the transfer pricing adjustments. So we don't know exactly what the amount of the deficiencies would be, but somewhat less than the original $3.3 billion. All right. Have you heard from practitioners about how they view this motion for reconsideration? The practitioners I've spoken to have been largely skeptical of these arguments, particularly the arguments regarding uh, alleged constitutional violations, which is somewhat striking. Uh, usually, you know, private practitioners are, you know, a little more critical of decisions that, you know, go in favor of the IRS. So, you know, in light of the general reception, which has generally been, you know, more or less uh, approving of the tax court's decision, Coca-Cola's prospects of success are unclear. All right. So let's turn to the more recent trial that you covered. That would be Medtronic. Could you first give us an idea of what is the main issue in that case? Well, so the the main issue is the proper selection of method. As in Coca-Cola, it's also a dispute about whether the comparable profits method, the IRS's chosen method, is the best method, or in this case, whether the comparable uncontrolled transaction method or cut method was a more reliable method. This is actually the second trial in the case, which was remanded by the Eighth Circuit. After the tax court basically handed Medtronic an almost complete win in a 2016 decision, that decision was vacated on appeal in 2018. According to the Eighth Circuit, the tax court had failed to support its opinion with the factual findings required by the regulations. The focus of the second trial was on the selection of transfer pricing method and determination of any necessary adjustments to the results of applying that method. So as it argued in the first trial, Medtronic said that the cut method was the best method, which it applied on the basis of a 1992 litigation settlement agreement with Siemens Paysetter Inc. The Paysetter agreement was a cross-license of both parties' cardiological device patent portfolios, and it settled a number of disputes between the companies, including patent infringement claims. So Medtronic argues that the differences between the Paysetter agreement and a 2001 license of cardiological and neurological device patents along with a range of other intangibles relating to those patents, to its manufacturing subsidiary, that those differences can be reliably accounted for through adjusting the royalty originally charged in that pace setter agreement. And the tax court had originally accepted this approach in 2016. The IRS, on the other hand, says that the differences between these two licenses in terms of the circumstances of the transaction and the scope of licensed intangibles are just too great to be resolved through adjustments, and that the allocation of profit that results from applying this method between Medtronic US and Puerto Rico was unreasonable. And as a result, according to the IRS, these differences require using a different transfer pricing method or the CPM. All right, so what sort of things did you hear at the trial? Well, the, the parties for the most part sort of repeated the, in many ways the arguments that they've made since the beginning. But Judge Kathleen Kerrigan, the, the judge who oversaw the first trial, and this one as well. She said that she would approach the issue of adjustments differently than she did in her 2016 opinion. But at the same time, she indicated that she's still leaning in favor of using the pay setter agreement and then adjusting the royalty to account for differences between it and Medtronic's controlled license. Judge Kerrigan acknowledged flaws in both parties' approaches, but in her remarks at the conclusion of the trial, she suggested that the IRS's CPM-based approach was the more flawed of the two. She said the adjustments that she's sort of envisioning may turn the method into an unspecified method instead of, you know, a version of the cut method. But at the same time, the, this unspecified method would still use the pay setter agreement as the original reference point. And it's an interesting position in light of the Eighth Circuit's seeming skepticism of, of whether the, the pay setter agreement could be used as a comparable even though the Eighth Circuit's opinion sort of focuses on the failure to make factual findings that, that were necessary under the regulation's comparability standards, it, it generally strikes a skeptical tone about whether the agreement you know, should be considered comparable. And one of the judges issued a, a concurring opinion that very strongly suggests that, that this agreement could not be considered comparable. So it, it's not clear whether the Eighth Circuit, if an eventual appeal takes place, whether the Eighth Circuit would share Judge Kerrigan's views on the case. So I understand that there's also a new transfer pricing case that the transfer pricing community will be tracking closely. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So in early August, the U.S. biotech company Amgen Inc. told its investors that it filed a tax court petition contesting $3.6 billion in deficiencies. And these deficiencies related to transfer pricing adjustments 
for the 2010 through 2012 tax years. It's interesting in that the announcement suggests some strong parallels with Medtronic. Like Medtronic, the case involves the allocation of profit to a Puerto Rican manufacturing subsidiary and whether the returns initially allocated by the company and then argued by the IRS are reasonable in light of the transfer pricing regulations. It's also interesting, just in light of the amounts involved, that $3.6 billion figure represents only deficiencies, not interest and penalties. And on top of that, the company announced that there are similar adjustments for 2013 through 2015 that are currently in the IRS appeals process, and that more adjustments may be forthcoming based on similar grounds for 2016 through 2018. Amgen hasn't provided any dollar amounts for those adjustments, but judging from the deficiencies for 2010 through 2012, they're likely to involve significant amounts. All right, well, we'll have to watch this space. Ryan, thank you for being here. Thank you. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief, Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Note State, Annette Nellen suggests five appropriately challenging state tax tasks for the state tax pentathlon in honor of the Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Two professors examine the 2020 Mississippi law taxing some retirement benefits from the state's public employees' retirement system. In Tax Notes International, Andrew Hughes outlines the strategy Coca-Cola used in its motion for reconsideration before the U.S. tax court and considers whether the company chose the best strategy. Lucas de Lima Carvalho examines the term best practices in international taxation and considers how the concept could affect the adoption of a multilateral instrument. In Featured Analysis, Roxanne Bland examines the Ninth Circuit's decision in Big Sandy and the complicated limits of state tax and regulatory authority on Native American tribes. On the Opinions page, Nana Amar Sarfo examines a proposal to collect tax from the largest polluters in the United States. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here's Tax Notes Federal Editor-in-Chief Ariel Greenblum. Thanks, Paige. I'm here with Stephen Curtis, the president of Cross Border Analytics, Inc., to discuss the two part article he co authored with David Chamberlain titled Apple's Cost Sharing Arrangement Frankenstein's Monster. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thank you, Ariel. Glad to be here. To begin, could you give us a brief overview of the article? Sure. The article is a summary or a, an overview or even a, an examination, if you will, of Apple's cost sharing arrangement. And the paper uh, looks at Apple's cost-sharing arrangement really through the lens of Section 482-7, a little bit sort of the history of this regulation and its intent and sort of the outcome of the regulations and Treasury's attempts to revise the regulations, reform the regulations to prevent some of the negative outcomes of this regulation. And so when you look at it through that lens, and this is a reference to the title, you can probably surmise that we believe that the cost-sharing regulations themselves are really this sort of Frankenstein regulation that the Treasury wrote beginning back in the late 1960s with the idea that this would increase multinational pre-tax income. But in reality, like Dr. Frankenstein's monster, it didn't really have that intended effect. And in fact, it had quite the opposite effect where it undermined and really eviscerated the arm's length principle and resulted in what you might describe as unlimited profit shifting to foreign jurisdictions, usually uh, low tax, tax haven type holding companies and shell companies. So through that lens, we look at Apple's cost sharing arrangement. And the paper unfolds by first looking at Apple as, uh, as you might in a typical transfer pricing analysis or evaluation where we look at where is the value uh, at Apple created and where are the profits of Apple booked. So to the extent that there's a divergence there that would give us some information to work with. And in doing that, we look at Apple's SEC filings and we actually looked at, at books, any information that's in the, in the public domain to sort of build the cases of what we think might be going on. But then we move on to a regulatory analysis of the facts that are there. And this opens up a whole new door of a, a analysis, if you will, because as the listeners may be aware, you know, Apple was investigated 
back in 2013 by the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. And from that investigation, a, a lot of documents came out from Apple's operations and, and their tax compliance. And that also triggered a, an investigation of state aid by the European Commission. And that's ongoing in the courts in the General Court of the European Union, and, and Apple has filed some documents there. So out of the European Commission investigation, we got even more insight into Apple's operations. And then documents that Apple filed to the court gave us even more information. So there's a plethora of information that's out there in the public domain that allows us to really perform a maybe reliable, indicative analysis, if you will, of what we think you know could be going on. So when we apply the regulatory analysis, we really focus on these 2008 transfer pricing regulations for cost sharing, which introduced this new concept of periodic adjustment under the regulation 482-7I6. We also focus on the transition rules in these regulations, which is the 482-7M rules. So what we find in comparing these documents that are coming out of these various investigations and also other supporting information in the public domain, it looks like the transition rules do not appear to have been complied with, which would then trigger some outcomes. Interestingly, the regulations never envisioned that a taxpayer would not comply with the transition rules and that the IRS would subsequently uh, sanction or not challenge the cost sharing arrangement because the transition rules basically say that if you don't comply with these transition rules, you don't have a cost sharing arrangement. But of course, the IRS has closed all of Apple's tax years through 2015 and has respected Apple's cost sharing arrangement. So this opens up this unanswered question within the regs that, okay, what, what happens now? Our understanding and interpretation of the regulations is that from 2009 onward, this would create a, a fact pattern in which Apple would be deemed to have a new cost-sharing arrangement under these 2008 cost-sharing rules. And under those conditions, we would apply a periodic adjustment. And in doing so, the paper performs these calculations and we come up with uh, a result. And so this is basically how the paper is uh, laid out. And it does indicate that there would be a, a fairly uh, substantial adjustment at Apple um, from not complying with these regulations on the order of around uh, 80 to $84 billion. But these are under very conservative assumptions that we explain in, in the paper. Thank you. Where did you get the idea to write this piece? You know, we've been doing work on transfer pricing compliance and enforcement for a couple of years, maybe six to, to eight years, where we're looking at the use of forensic technology and capabilities in transfer pricing compliance and enforcement. In fact, we have an academic paper, though, that's the title of one of our academic papers, where we go into some of the research behind our technologies and models. And we've been focused on this for a while. We want it to be part of the discussion around tax compliance and enforcement, uh, if you will, which seems to have gotten a, a, a lot of attention lately, uh, especially in, in the press. So for instance, when the Biden administration came in and began proposing to invest money into the IRS to increase an IRS enforcement capability with this idea that we could reduce the tax gap and that this would be a pay for for some of the infrastructure uh, spending, this triggered a, a whole bunch of research that looks like it was ongoing anyway, but it focused certainly more intention on this research. So for instance, we had been working with Kimberly Clausing at Reed College, who is now at Treasury, because her research is uh, focused directly on offshore profit shifting by multinational corporations. So her estimates of this have, have been around $100 billion per year of tax underpayments that come about because of offshore profit shifting by U.S. multinationals, you know, this is not included in the tax gap estimate by the IRS. International tax avoidance is, and, and evasion is not included in the tax gap estimate. So there's information on this from various GAO reports and such. But when Commissioner Reddick came out and sort of agreed with some of this research, 
effectively by saying that the tax gap might actually be closer to a trillion dollars a year. And that this, a big part of this was wealthy and corporate tax underpayments. We already sort of knew that, I think, in, in the industry. But how we wanted to contribute to this debate, and, and let me just say before I, I, I talk about this. So then th- there was research by Larry Summers and Natasha Saran, who, who is now at Treasury as well, on the return on investment from these investments in IRS enforcement. And he's they're putting out some numbers on the order of 50 to one. So if you just look at the hundred billion dollars of what we might call, you know, tax underpayments from offshore profit shifting, mostly occurring through transfer pricing, it might take investments on the order of $2 billion to attempt to to get back uh, $100 billion per year. So these are big numbers. So the question is, well, how real are these numbers? And could you identify one or more cases out there that would either validate these estimates or really maybe undermine them. You know, they're either about par with what's really there, or maybe they're vastly overstated or or maybe they're understated. So we thought, well, let's use some of the technologies and capabilities that we have developed. Let's find a case out there and let's look at it. Apple looked like it was the perfect case because there's so much information in the public domain on Apple's cost sharing arrangements that, okay, we can go out and do this analysis and if it supports that there's a big number there, maybe some of these estimates are quite valid and maybe 50 to one, maybe it's a hundred to one in some segments of tax enforcement. So what we found was essentially that, yes, it looks like in certain cases, and, and I'll point out that, you know, Apple is engaged in this, in a cost sharing arrangement that we've analyzed and come to some conclusions that looks like it's aggressive, looks like there was some non-compliance, the numbers are big. But, you know, there's dozens, if not hundreds or more uh, taxpayers that are engaged in cost sharing arrangements that set them up pretty much like Apple did. You know, this Frankenstein result from the regulations that the IRS has found virtually impossible to enforce. So we may conclude from this analysis that, well, it looks like the money's there if only the IRS can bend over and sort of pick it up. And then the question is, well, okay, what's it going to take? to get from A to to B to actually recover some of this, uh, these tax underpayments on the scale that they seem to be. So, you know, one area is technology devoted to risk analysis and risk detection. Another technology might be devoted towards forensic investigation. So if the IRS were to approach enforcement, and I'm speaking mostly about LB&I, because you're actually seeing some of this in, in the criminal investigation division where there are, I think they just announced they're creating a forensic center, a centralized forensic capability for enforcement, to support enforcement. So you may be looking at something like this, where you can actually bring in these technologies and advanced resources to be able to sort of perform this more capable uh, type of enforcement, technology-enabled enforcement. And if you look at our paper, is almost, a, let's just say you look at it as a let's say a revenue agent report, you know, you look at it as an outcome of an examination, it would seem a little unrealistic, I think, to expect that, you know, an international examiner performing an exam in LB&I would do this much research and they would need some capabilities that we're using to do this level of analysis to then get it something to the point that the IRS and council uh, would be comfortable sort of going after. So this was our contribution, if you will, to this ongoing debate, which I think has captured more attention in the public uh, sphere and more interest among people outside of the tax profession, especially in Congress and the executive branch. Really fascinating. Thank you. Before we go, could you tell us where listeners could find you online? Sure. So I'm up on LinkedIn. So anyone can contact me uh, on LinkedIn. We have a website, xba.com, but I'm also at s.curtis at xba.com. So happy to hear from any listeners with uh, opinions. I've I've heard from a few already. Welcome all uh, commentary and uh, reviews, and um, happy to be part of the debate and the discussion on these topics. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast, Steve. Thank you, Ariel.
You can find Stephen's article online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Analysts, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy in tax notes. Again, that's Tax Analysts with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish, and guest relations coordinator, Krista Goad.